On August 10th, 1999, Joshua Hayes was killed in Jacksonville, Florida. On January 26th, 2003, Jean O'Neill was killed in Greenock, Scotland. Philip Harkins was accused of the first, he fled the country, and then he committed the second. A murder suspect was sentenced to five years yesterday for killing a taxi passenger in a car crash. Philip had to serve time in a British prison for the deadly crash before he could be returned to Florida. But his potential extradition became one of the longest fights in British legal history. And it revealed key details of what happened on the boat ramp in Florida years earlier. Yet in all that time, Josh's mom, Patricia, was left with almost no news. Except for me. This is the story of how the murder of Joshua Hayes in Florida led to a killing in Scotland, and how the battle to get the suspect back to America spun years beyond anyone's expectations. Chapter 4. End of the Line My name is Tristan Stewart-Robertson, and I'm a reporter in Scotland who has been following this story for 15 years. Somebody shot Josh at the Oak Harbor boat ramp. Yeah, there somebody been shot down at the boat dock. Philip is the suspect. So when he fled, the U.S. asked for him back. But when he killed somebody else, that created two conflicting legal streams. The extradition couldn't happen until everything in the U.K. was settled. Now, I've been reporting from courts for years. I'm fascinated by courts and the law. But covering the courts is also one of the most important parts of journalism. Justice must be seen to be done. The cases I'll cover in this episode add up to a few hundred pages of legal precedents and terminology. And what it meant is this case was in limbo for years. To understand why we have to look at how Philip moved up and down in the courts and tested rights again and again. Philip was on hold. Patricia and the rest of Josh's family were on hold. But that fact barely earned a mention in all these cases. And much of what the courts debated was about what might happen 20, 30 years in the future. Here's how an extradition case would work in theory. A foreign country asks for the extradition of someone in the UK to face trial. A court then looks at the request and decides if there is a case to answer, or a prima facie case. Then the UK Home Secretary referred to in court cases as the Secretary of State, orders the extradition. The court might decide there is a case to answer, but it's a politician who signs off on it. And then in the UK, there is the power to apply for a judicial review. So a court considers whether the political decision was lawful. Judicial reviews have been used since the 1980s, and right-wing politicians and media are keen to scrap or limit the right to judicial review so they can ensure governments can do what they like without scrutiny. So what happened in Philip's case? The extradition request was made to the UK soon after Philip was in the car crash. In July 2003, there was an extradition hearing. There is no public record of that hearing, but we know from later appeals 
that the extradition laid out the Florida prosecution claims. Prosecutors in Jacksonville, and on their behalf the entire U.S. government, said Philip was arrested the day after the murder, August the 11th, 1999. He claimed that at the time of the murder, he was with his girlfriend, sometimes referred to as his fiancée, Keisha Thompson. He said he was dropped at her home by Terry Glover. Philip said it was his information that led to Terry being arrested. First, Terry denied knowledge of the shooting. Then, he said Philip and a man named Tony Randall did the murder. Then, Terry pinned it all on Philip. Tony was interviewed, as was a teenager named Leon Madden. Both said they were at the boat ramp. They claimed Philip wasn't at the scene and did not match the description of the killer. In September 1999, Philip was told he wouldn't be prosecuted, and in November, they dropped the prosecution. But a new prosecutor took over and made a deal with Terry Glover to testify against Philip. Philip was indicted, and there was a notice that prosecutors would seek the death penalty. The case alleged that Terry Glover went to see Philip at his apartment, just as Josh was leaving. Josh wanted to buy marijuana. Philip wanted to rob Josh and told Terry his plan. He got Terry to drive him to the boat ramp. Terry agreed on the condition he got paid. Philip took his rifle with him. Tony Randall and Leon Madden were in a second car with Josh. Philip and Terry approached the other car and ordered everyone out and to lie on the ground. Tony and Leon did, but Josh supposedly refused to lie down or give up his money. Terry said Philip swung the gun and hit Josh in the face. It went off. Philip and Terry fled the scene and threw the gun in the river. One of the other men identified Philip's voice. Other witnesses said they saw Philip leave his home with the gun. After he was indicted, Philip later claimed Tony said he was offered a deal to testify against Philip by the prosecutor and by police. Tony was allegedly told other charges against him would be dropped and he would be immune from charges related to the murder. A later court summary said Philip attended all court hearings in Florida. On or about December the 11th, 2001, he left the U.S. You might remember that six months before the judge in Florida asked where Philip was. So, that's the basic case laid out by the U.S., as summarized in U.K. courts. It included a sworn statement from Terry. And that's what was presented to District Judge Caroline Tubbs in July 2003. In that hearing, Philip's lawyer pointed out the inconsistencies with Terry's statements, the other witnesses who denied Philip was there, and the deal with Terry, and the attempted deal with Tony. The judge said all that could be dealt with in Florida. She said there was a case to answer, or a prima facie case. And that is the fundamental question considered in 2003, and again later. Is there a case against Philip that requires him to answer those charges by being extradited? Yes, said the judge. I find that the evidence contained in Terry Glover's affidavit establishes a prima facie case on the charges against Philip Harkins. The judge ordered Philip be detained in prison 
until there was an order from the Home Secretary to surrender him to the Americans. Nothing could happen, though, because Philip was also in jail for killing Jean O'Neill. He was jailed for that for five years. Now, I should explain what five years means in Scottish justice. It's five years on paper, but not in prison. Most prisoners in Scotland are automatically released after serving half of their sentences. And because Philip had already been locked up awaiting trial, the five years started before he even pleaded guilty. He was given credit for time already served. So two and a half years takes us to March 2006. Philip should have been released from prison then for killing in Scotland, but he was still being held over the alleged killing in Florida. Now the extradition process resumed. The UK government asked Philip if he had any fresh arguments to make. Philip asked for time to track down his former girlfriend, or fiancé, Keisha. In June 2006, the UK Home Secretary ordered Philip's extradition. Philip appealed. Specifically, he asked for a judicial review of the decision. The judge in 2003 told Philip he could raise a writ of habeas corpus, so he could demand he be brought to court and argue that he was unlawfully detained by the state. He was in jail for the Scottish death, but, on paper at least, he could have been released in the extradition case. Philip did not argue he was unlawfully detained by the state until three years later. And even then, it wasn't a formal application. He just included habeas corpus arguments in his judicial review appeal. When the hearing was finally held in February 2007, the court said his habeas corpus points would be covered by the review itself. And 2007 is where I come in. I was a reporter working in Greenock, and we got a fax from the court agency selling coverage of Philip's hearing. I hadn't been in the town at the time of the 2003 crash and arrest, so 2007 was the first I heard of the case, and I've been following the story ever since that fax. The formal account of the 2007 case is very detailed, but it has a number of factual errors, such as wrong dates or names. I don't know if those are because wrong information was given to the court or if it's just how the case has been presented, but they don't affect the substantial arguments Philip made, nor the outcome. And Philip now aged 28, laid out his position himself. He had legal representation at previous stages, but stood on his own in 2007 against the governments of the UK and the US. According to the court report, wearing a suit and tie, Philip addressed two senior judges in a broad Scottish accent. Mr. Justice Lloyd-Jones sitting with the president of the Queen's Bench Division, the aptly named Sir Igor Judge, he said he, quote, presented his arguments ably and efficiently in circumstances which have not been easy for him. Philip first argued there was insufficient evidence against him in Florida. And he said a conviction would be, quote, extremely improbable. He said Terry Glover was the only evidence against him. And he pointed to Terry's inconsistent accounts. In one version, Terry said Philip fired the gun and shot Josh. In another, he swung the gun, hitting him, and the gun went off. And of course, Terry at first denied any knowledge of what happened at the boat ramp. But the court said the original judge four years earlier considered the evidence, and then the Home Secretary considered the strength of the case, including inconsistencies. There was enough for a trial in England and Wales, 
so there was enough for a trial in the U.S. And all the problems with evidence could be put under a microscope in a U.S. court. Philip's other focus on Terry was the deal he made with prosecutors. He said it was an abusive process. He said Terry's affidavit never should have been included in the extradition submission, and now it should be excluded under UK rules of evidence. But the court rejected that point too. They said there appeared to be no violation of, quote, civilized values, and it would be wrong to superimpose local notions of fairness. Again, evidence can be tested as admissible or fair in Florida. Philip then turned to the passage of time. He couldn't get a fair trial now because it was approaching eight years since the murder. He said the Home Secretary should have considered the two years of delays before he left America, and those two years were the prosecution's fault. He said he couldn't find his alibi witnesses, and he got into a relationship with a new woman and couldn't be expected to restrict the movements of his former fiancée, Keisha. The delays he cited were between August 14, 1999, the date of his formal arrest for murder, and a date in 2002 when he got an email from his lawyer saying he was needed in court. He had already left the country by that point. The court was blunt in rejecting Philip's claims. He absconded from the U.S. Only Philip was responsible for the delay. In the present case, the claimant deliberately absconded knowing that he faced a murder trial. He then committed a very serious criminal offence in Scotland, which resulted in his imprisonment. He could not be surrendered until after the expiration of his sentence. Furthermore, I accept that there was no culpable delay on the part of the prosecuting authorities in the United States. They acted with expedition in identifying that the claimant had fled to Scotland. The Scottish authorities were unable to trace the claimant until the accident on 25th of January 2003. Accordingly, the passage of time since, at the latest, 12th of July 2002, is entirely attributable to the claimant. Finally, Philip turned to the death penalty. Now, Britain doesn't have capital punishment so nobody could be sent to a country where they would face the death penalty. The state of Florida said in February 2000 that they would pursue the death penalty. But by the time of the extradition request in 2003, they had withdrawn this. And in a diplomatic note in June 2005, the Embassy of the United States of America gave their own assurances that Philip would not be executed if extradited. Philip said the assurances weren't enough because they came from the U.S., not the state of Florida. He insisted only the Florida governor could promise the state wouldn't seek the death penalty. And he said if he was convicted, the state would have to consider seeking his death. The U.K. Judicial Review said there was no evidence the U.S. was not acting in good faith. They had had five treaties on extradition with the U.K. over more than 150 years. But the court adjourned the case for a week to check with U.S. authorities. They got an affidavit from Mark Borello, the latest state attorney on the case. He repeated their position. They would not ask to put Philip to death. He said the assurances of the U.S. government were binding on Florida under the extradition treaty. Both that assurance and Philip's other failed points were enough for the court. Mr. Justice Lloyd-Jones said he was entirely satisfied. I consider that the Secretary of State was entitled to accept the diplomatic note as an effective and reliable assurance that the death penalty would not be sought or imposed in the case. He was entitled to conclude that an order for the return of the claimant to the United States of America would not be unjust 
or oppressive or constitute a breach of the claimant's rights under the European Convention on Human Rights. For these reasons, I would refuse the application for judicial review. Sir Igor, the President of the Court, confirmed the application must be refused. And the application for habeas corpus also failed. Sir Igor turned to Philip. Are there any applications? Yes. Mr. Harkins, I understand you want to make an application to us for leave to appeal to the House of Lords? Philip wanted to continue his fight at the House of Lords, then the UK's highest court, on the sole point of the death penalty risk, despite the assurances he wasn't facing it. The President said, I am afraid, Mr. Harkins, that we do not think that there is any point of law which we would certify for consideration in the House of Lords. But, in any event, we should refuse leave. Where does that leave me now? asked Philip. As far as the proceedings in this country are concerned, that is the end of the line. Philip asked if there was anything that he could do to get his case to the House of Lords. He said it would be unfortunate if the American authorities came and picked him up before the case was turned around in his favour. I am sorry I cannot help you about what the consequences are of our decision in relation to how the authorities will deal with the application for extradition, because I do not know. So far as the court process is concerned in this country, you have now exhausted the remedies that are available to you. What about the European Court of Human Rights? The short answer to that is I do not know. Philip asked what happens next. What was the time limit? He didn't know how soon someone would pick him up to send him to Florida. There is a limit you see as to what I can tell you. A, because I cannot, and B, because I do not actually know. You are acting for yourself. If I were you, my strong advice would be to get in touch with the solicitors, Levies, who have been acting for you right through until the hearing before us and take their advice. That is what I would do, and that is the advice I would give you. The President of the Court said it was the end of the line. It wasn't. Philip was told in 2003 there was a case for him to answer in Florida. In 2007, he claimed there was insufficient evidence. He said that Terry's evidence was an abusive process. He claimed that the trial would be unjust or oppressive, and he feared that he faced the death penalty. He lost on all those points there was still a case to answer in Florida. And he was refused an appeal of the judicial review. The president of the court didn't know anything about applying to the European Court of Human Rights. But Philip applied four days later. And six weeks after that, the European court blocked any extradition until further notice. So what is this court? Just as there is a U.S. Bill of Rights and Constitution, or the South African Bill of Rights, in Europe, there is the European Convention on Human Rights. Forty-six countries are signed up to the Convention. They're known as contracting states. That includes almost all of Europe, including Turkey, Georgia, and Ukraine. Russia was a party to the Convention, but was kicked out when they invaded Ukraine. The U.S. and Canada have their own rights for citizens, so aren't signed up to the Convention. So they're known as non-contracting states. The European Court of Human Rights protects the rights of the Convention. So when I'm talking Convention, I mean the European Convention. And when I'm talking about the European Court, it's this European Court of Human Rights. There is one judge 
from each of the 46 convention states. Those then sort and decide cases in different combinations. Between 1959 and 2020, the court took more than 920,000 applications, but only about 50,000 actually had judgments. Most were dismissed. There are five sections of the court which take up cases, and then, above them, there is the Grand Chamber. Unlike the smaller and more elitist U.S. Supreme Court of nine justices, the Grand Chamber for the European Court of Human Rights has 17 judges. Now, you can't get very far in a given day without somebody talking about my rights. And human rights is a term that's used all the time, sometimes to defend yourself, sometimes to attack others. Human rights are usually described as universal and as inalienable, or so permanent that they can't be taken away. But human rights are relatively new to history in law. They've been defined in the past with other terms, and they've always been written by somebody, usually men and usually white straight men. You can easily find politicians and columnists in the UK denouncing human rights. They claim that human rights are imposed on them by foreign countries, or that rights are in limited supply and not everyone can have them, and not everyone should. And they ignore that the European Convention was proposed by Winston Churchill, and largely written by British lawyers. They were intended to be for all people in Europe, no matter what. That European Convention covers many similar rights to those in the U.S. Bill of Rights and U.S. Constitution. But they have varied language and are in a different order. Freedom of speech is part of the First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, but freedom of expression is number 10 in Europe. Slavery wasn't prohibited in the original U.S. Constitution, but formed Article 4 for Europe. Europe has no right to bear arms. The word torture is not strictly prohibited by the U.S. Bill of Rights, though the Eighth Amendment to the Constitution prohibits cruel and unusual punishment. That's usually considered to include torture. Article 3 of the European Convention explicitly prohibits torture and inhuman or degrading treatment or punishment. And it was under Article 3 that Philip appealed to the European Court. He previously argued that the threat of execution was an infringement of his rights, and the Convention does prohibit execution. So if there was a risk of his facing execution, he could not be extradited. But remember, there were multiple assurances that Philip wouldn't be put to death if he was convicted in Florida. And he lost in his judicial review on this argument. But that didn't stop him trying to argue the point again. And even if he didn't face execution, he would be sentenced to life without parole. And he said that was a breach of Article 3. It was an inhuman punishment. After the European court halted his extradition, after just six weeks, they asked the UK government for their opinion. The whole process then went into limbo for more than three years. Part of this was because they were waiting for a separate extradition case in the UK. It went up to the House of Lords, then the highest court in the UK, and it was en route to the European court 
when the person decided to drop his appeal and return to the U.S. In a later court decision, those three years are dismissed almost out of hand and without explanation or justification. But Philip and his lawyers did make fresh arguments based on that other UK case. And a US professor wrote the first of a few affidavits about Florida's life without parole sentences. The European court then handed Philip's case back to English courts because he hadn't exhausted all options there. So after three years of the case being in Europe, it was now back in the UK. And in January 2011, his case got merged with the extradition cases of two other men and one woman. All four argued that life without parole was inconsistent with Article 3 of the European Convention. Now, Philip raised the death penalty risk in 2007, but didn't mention the risk of life without parole and it being a breach of Article 3 at all. This was new. Of course, he still argued he wasn't at the boat ramp in Jacksonville at all. But if he was there, then it was an accidental killing, according to his summary of the prosecution's alleged case. His lawyers said the case rested exclusively on the evidence of Terry Glover. They called Terry highly controversial. In Florida, there are two ways to be sentenced to life without parole. One is for first degree or premeditated murder. The other, called the felony murder rule, is if the murder is committed along with another felony crime, so in this case, armed robbery. The gun was loaded before arrival and cocked before Philip got out of the car. Philip's lawyers were again critical of the case against him, as Philip had been himself back in 2007. But just as it was then, that's not a matter for an extradition case. And a future case isn't relevant to questioning a potential future punishment. And remember, it's the punishment or sentence that's being argued about under Article 3. Philip's lawyers raised his youth at the time of the crime, just weeks short of his 21st birthday. And they said his previous firearms offense was when he was a juvenile, and he was effectively let off with a caution. But Philip also told a psychiatrist that he had a, quote, criminal lifestyle and engaged in drug dealing and displayed a familiarity with firearms. The High Court said it was wholly unreal to suggest Philip could be tried in England instead of Florida. And they refused to consider new evidence. This included Philip saying there was a risk he would be raped in a U.S. prison. The court said it was all too late for such material. And English lawyers were not competent to comment on U.S. law. Philip's lawyers argued he was at risk of being jailed for life for an accidental killing. The court said, quote, there was no such accident here. The alleged facts of the present case are shocking indeed. However analysed, should Mr Harkins be convicted, he will have committed a grave crime. Even on the most favourable, realistic view of the facts for Mr Harkins, his culpability will be high. On the alleged facts of this case, a severe sentence would be a punishment fitting the crime. On the evidence they had, even in a UK court, Philip could expect a sentence well into double figures, said the court. So if that's the case, would life without parole be clearly disproportionate? That's the standard required to determine if it breaches Article 3. Yes, it might not be the sentence given out in the UK for such a crime, but it was not disproportionate. And the crime was made worse by the gun being loaded and cocked. And the court was critical of the danger of extradition being blocked over this. In Philip's case and that of the accused woman, they would get a, quote, 
handsome reward for flight. The court concluded that, ultimately, it was not for UK courts to dictate what sentences non-European or non-contracting states could impose as sentences. So, again, Philip lost. There was no risk of him being executed, and life without parole was not a breach of his rights. He applied to take the case to the UK Supreme Court, which now replaced the House of Lords as the final court of appeal. He was refused. But the European Court of Human Rights took back the case. So we are back in Europe again. This was what was called the Fourth Chamber. That's a group of seven judges within one of the sections of the European Court. One of the judges was from the UK. Philip brought up the death penalty again. That fear was dismissed as, quote, manifestly ill-founded. He also brought in the psychiatric report. It concluded, quote, that he demonstrated features of histrionic and dependent personality disorder, together with features of narcissistic and borderline personality disorder. This would make him less able to cope with a long period of imprisonment, particularly when systematic bullying and sexual abuse in American prisons were common public knowledge. The report stopped short of diagnosing him with such a disorder. Philip had already been in jail for nearly nine years at this point. But the main issue was life without parole. Philip maintained that such a punishment would be grossly disproportionate for the alleged crime, and the sentence was irreducible, essentially meaning he couldn't be let out early. The UK government argued a life sentence isn't inhuman at the time of sentencing unless it is disproportionate. So let me explain it this way. If someone stole a loaf of bread and was sentenced to life in prison, that's clearly a disproportionate punishment at the time the person is sentenced. A life sentence for murder isn't inhuman at that stage, but after years or even decades, is it appropriate or is it inhuman for that person to still be in prison? The Article 3 violation comes when continued imprisonment can't be justified for punishment or deterrence. The UK government stated, quote, Even for an offender aged under 21, murder with a firearm or in the course of a robbery could attract a minimum sentence of 30 years imprisonment in England and Wales. Article 3 is absolute. You cannot subject someone to torture or to inhuman or degrading treatment or punishment. But the court said that doesn't rule out extradition entirely, especially to a country with a long history of respect for democracy, human rights, and the rule of law. The European Convention is not a way to impose standards on others. And the same crime can be punished in different ways across the 46 nations signed up to the convention. The fourth chamber of the European court was not persuaded that a life sentence was grossly disproportionate. And they shared the view that there was no such accident. There was no violation of Article 3. So, this decision happened in January 2012. Patricia believed her fight to bring Philip back was coming to an end. So did I. Patricia had no access to the courts overseas. She couldn't see what was happening, just press reports afterwards. She told me she never heard from the U.S. government. She would search Google every day, and maybe once a year, I kept her informed of the limited progress. Otherwise, she was left in limbo this whole time, as Philip and the courts debated a possible conviction from a trial 
that couldn't happen yet. After the 2012 European case, there's a story online about how Patricia was told by a UK reporter that Philip would now be sent back to Florida. I would not have been that explicit, but Philip had lost at the European level, as well as every step in the UK. I did not see any avenues left open. Like the original 2007 case judge, I thought this was the end of the line. It still wasn't. Courts said Philip could be extradited in 2003, and in 2007, and in 2011, and in 2012. But it wasn't over. One reason is that European decisions are drafts and wait to see if there are any appeals to the Grand Chamber, or if the Grand Chamber wants to take up the case. A decision is an interim one until that point. And partly, too, a new case came on the scene, and it moved in parallel to Philip's case. It had the same interim decision date in January 2012, and then six months later, in July, the Grand Chamber made Philip's case decision final, but they picked up the other case to look at it again. That case was called Vinter and Others versus the United Kingdom. It saw some of Britain's worst killers claim that what were called whole life sentences in England and Wales were inhuman. It is, effectively, life without parole. And a year later, the Grand Chamber said they were right. Sort of. Basically, they said the sentencing guidelines were too vague. At the time of sentencing, someone had to know what they had to do, in theory, to potentially get released, and how long they had to wait to apply. So that decision was in July 2013. Just days before that, Philip made another application for judicial review. When Vinter was handed down, he changed his argument to use that case as proof that his Article Three rights were at risk. So now Philip has dragged us back to UK courts. It took six months for the High Court to decide to take the case and set a hearing another six months down the line. Now it's July 2014, a month shy of 15 years since the murder. Philip's lawyer argued Vinter was a considerable advance for the court, and that meant there must be a real prospect of release and a dedicated review mechanism, and that review must be capable of being challenged in court. More evidence was submitted about life without parole in the U.S., and it was rejected again. His lawyers repeated the suggestion of Philip being tried in the U.K., instead of Florida. That was rejected again. They said Florida prosecutors could have charged Philip with manslaughter, or agree to send him back to the UK upon conviction, or agree before a trial that he would not be sentenced to life. Philip tried to bring in claims to Article 5 of the European Convention, the right to liberty and security, and Article 6, the right to a fair trial the right to not face inhuman or degrading treatment, the right to liberty and security, the right to a fair trial. Yes, these are being raised by a criminal or an alleged criminal. But rights apply to all citizens of the 46 nations. And decisions by politicians 
or courts about those rights could affect anyone. Me. You. Philip wanted his Article 5 and 6 rights protected. But in nearly a decade of legal fights, he hadn't raised either of those until now. And the High Court rejected them. The UK government accepted that they had a continuing duty to keep an extradition under review. Philip's lawyers argued that meant that because Vinter changed the law, Philip's extradition could no longer go ahead. The government argued, and ultimately the court decided, the case didn't amount to a significant change. The UK had warned that all European Convention states could become safe havens for those accused of murder in the US, knowing they could flee and wouldn't be extradited. The High Court rejected Philip's claims. In September, they sent their draft decision to the various lawyers. And here, it hit yet another speed bump. Four days before that draft, there was another Grand Chamber decision called Trebelsi versus Belgium. Belgium had ignored an interim measure from the European court and extradited a terrorist to the US. But the court also took the reasoning from Vinter and found life without parole sentences were incompatible with Article 3. They said life without parole lacked what's called reducibility, the potential for a whole life jail term to end at some point, either by government's clemency or by proving rehabilitation. So now the High Court had to consider the Trebelsi ruling in Philip's case. His lawyers argued again that convention law had changed. The court held another hearing in October 2014. But again, the court said Trebelsi just lifted Vinter and tried to apply it to extradition cases. The Human Rights Act in the UK required the court to consider Trebelsi, but not to follow it. So they declined to decide the case on what they called, quote, new and untried jurisprudence in this area. They refused to reopen his case on November 7th. Four days later, Philip applied for a second time to the European court. And just two days later, the court granted another interim measure to halt any extradition. The following March, the court granted the case priority. But Philip and Patricia were left to wait. And it took more than a year for progress. A Murder Without End is reported and edited by Tristan Stewart Robertson and produced by Liam Pollock. Original music by Dylan Anthony. Artwork by Jason Skinner. District Judge Tubbs was again read by Kate Hollins. Carl Vaughn read the statements of Justice Lloyd Jones and Sir Igor Judge. Sources for this episode are the case reports from UK and European courts. Links to all the cases I've mentioned are included in the information for this episode. 
journalism like this might be free to listen to, but it isn't free to make. A Murder Without End was created without any funding. All research, archive audio, voiceovers, and music were sourced and paid for by myself. So if you enjoyed what you heard, please share it with your friends, leave a review, and visit our website, tomorrow.is, to donate what you can. Any support you can spare would be invaluable. Thank you for listening.